Thank All right. You, Courtney, now. Great. Yeah. Hey, everybody. So uh, today we're going to hear from Renee Corbet on uh, the multi cover bifiltration. So this talk is sort of a follow up to the talk from last week that we heard. And uh, yeah, let's start, Renee. Thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, for the introduction, also for inviting me for uh, give, giving a little talk on the multi-cover bifurcation here. So um, it, it's a quite nice opportunity to be back in Albany, at least digitally, because this project also has started when I was in Albany, but physically. <laughs> and yeah, since uh, that is kind of part of the story, how, how that paper went, uh, became into existence, I will also um, give a little bit of information how um, how it worked um, or how, how the history of that paper looked. So there is a little bit of additional information in, in comparison to the paper that you can um, look at uh, in the archive. Yeah, so um, this work is uh, joined with Michael Kerber, Michael Lesnick, and Georg Osang, and it is on computing the multi-cover bifurcation. And we we take a a little bit a different um, point of view, but we will also use some of the things that Georg told us last week. So let me start with the motivation. Why, why have we been interested in, in computing the multi-cover bifiltration or the multi-cover bifiltration in general? So First of all, let me mention that it comes from persistent homology. And in general, persistent homology is unstable with respect to this kind of outliers to kind of some salt and pepper noise, for instance, or in general, if you just cannot control some random outliers. Persistent homology should be able, however, to dis detect this blue circle in this picture. But taking the, the union of both filtration or um, some, some nice discrete model like the alpha complex or something like this, um, the question is what kind of circles are detected by persistent homology? And the answer is unfortunate. It will rather detect these kind of circles. Maybe, maybe the, the big red one uh, at the right uh, or also the others, but not, not really the blue one. You, you could maybe guess that there was a blue circle if you, um, yeah, if you get a feeling for all these small circles inside, and if you know how that um, how that salt and pepper noise looks like, but that's very vague, and in general there's no chance at all. But we we want we want persistent homology, of course, uh, to be able to capture that. Now there there's one solution, and that solution would be just pre-processing. You can just get rid of all these points if you know how to do that. But that's not really what uh, we would expect from, from approaches from persistent homology, because maybe it is not that clear what is noise and what is not, just in, as in the usual setting. So we want to take um, um, a second parameter that captures the, that information. And that second parameter should um, capture local density. Yeah, right. So what can we do for this picture? We can do that using multi-covers or k-fold covers to be a little bit more precise about the density scale. So for k equals one, we can just look at the union of balls filtration. We have a couple of points and balls around these points with a certain radius. And we let the radius increase. And that's just the usual thing for one parameter persistence. We can, however, also look at those regions that are covered by two or more balls at once. This would be um, yeah, the two-fold cover. And we can also continue and do that for k equals three. These are the regions that are covered by three or more balls. And the collection of all such regions, letting the radius increase and let k decrease, 
gives us a two parameter family of increasing spaces, and that's the multi cover type equation. So actually, we are not going from one to three, but the other way around, because then we certainly get these inclusional spaces. Now, of course, in order to apply that or to use that in, in topological data analysis, we need a computer. And that's what this, uh, this, the, this project and also this talk is about. One of the things that is extremely useful in general and also for this project is the position of theorem. And I believe it deserves kind of a kind introduction. So how can we discretize multi-filtrations? Or in the following, I will often just say filtrations and maybe I mean multi-filtrations with that. Um, so if we don't have just a, if we don't have a filtration, but only a space, then there is the construction of the nerve. And that means if we have a, a cover of a space, then we can take the simplicial complex that you get by looking at, at, at all uh, common intersections of your cover elements. So for instance, these three bulbs here in the center have a three-fold intersection, and therefore we get this uh, triangle, this filled out triangle. And for instance, here for the top two bulbs, uh, we have a two-fold intersection, so we get this edge. And as you can see, um, the the, the space that you get by the union of, of all of these bolts is a multiple equivalent to this simplicial complex. And in general, we would like to have this uh, equivalence. It is not true in general, however. Even if you look at um, the space being the union of all your cover elements, that might uh, go wrong. So the left example might even look a little bit shady, depending on what your intuition is. But here it works well. So we have three color cover elements and uh, the nerve of this cover um, captures the same homology. And it's also multiple equivalent to that. At the right, you see, well, uh, in that space here at the top, um, there are some holes, but the nerve does not cover that. So it does not capture that. So that's a problem. And it is an old question to answer uh, when your covers are reasonably unproblematic so that um, the nerve does have the same homotopy type as the covered space itself. Yeah, and we may call that good covers. Yeah. We, we did, didn't invent that, that's an old term, uh, uh, although it doesn't say too much, but yeah. Yeah, no, so um, th that's a quite old approach and um, you, you can find um, a good, um, yeah, a good write up of what you can do in the book of Hatcher on applied, uh, on algebraic topology, mostly, uh, however, going back to um, even older work. Um, and a more recent approach is to get, uh, to look at closed convex subsets of Euclidean space, instead of the classical approach of having open covers, uh, open cover elements uh, that have, uh, in which all finite intersections are contractible, which you can see goes well for the left example, but not for the right one. Yeah. Um, so the second case is a little bit more restrictive, not strictly restrictive because open is not closed, but let's not focus too much on these technicalities. Um, the convexity statement here is, is quite restrictive, right? but it will turn out to be um, enough for, for what, what we want to do um, in, this, uh, in this project. But we want to generalize the uh, nerve theorem to filtrations and not just to individual spaces. So I need a little bit of terminology for that. So we have a post set and we define a filtration index over that post set to be a collection of spaces indexed by this set. And whenever you have um, a relation in that post set, you also have an inclusion um, for your topological spaces. Yeah, that's just the definition um, of a filtration index by a post set. And 
The morphism between two filtrations over the same pose set is a collection of continuous maps between the spaces at these individual elements uh, of your pose set. But these maps also have to commute with the inclusions of X and Y. Or if you like categorical language, uh, it is just a natural transformation um, if you view the p index filtration as a functor. Okay, so we want to get um, a NERF theorem also for these things. So we have to um, be aware of what the equivalence uh, statement actually means because you know we, we cannot just talk about homotopy equivalences anymore because we don't only have spaces, but filtrations. So first of all, a morphism of filtrations is called object-wise homotopy equivalence. If each of these maps here is a, is a homotopy equivalence itself, but that's not the appropriate thing to do. We want something slightly more general, namely um, two filtrations are said to be weakly equ equivalent if there is a zigzag diagram of these object-wise homotopy equivalences, yeah? So you want to, you might want to um, go in several direction and if X and Y are connected by um, homotopy, uh, object-wise homotopy equivalences in different directions, uh, that's enough for calling um, your filtrations weakly equivalent. And let me also remark that uh, this is um, quite a standard um, term in model category theory. Um, so, um, it really de deserves um, um, our attention to be called or to be um, thought of uh, as the natural thing. Yeah, the natural thing of generalizing homotopy um, equivalences. All right, so using that terminology, we can go over and define um, what we need for the persistent nerve theorem. First of all, our filtrations have to be covered as well. So a cover of a filtration, let's stay in Euclidean space, yeah, following the version of Edels, Brunner, and Terra. Um, then a cover of your, of your filtration is a collection of, um, of, uh, um, of filtrations such that for each element, we um, have a cover of these individual spaces, okay? and then we say that this collection is good if each individual um, element uh, is a good cover of your space at, at P. Yeah, and, and using that formulation, you can, um, you can uh, prove the position of the theorem. And it looks like this. If we have a P index filtration um, in Euclidean space, and a good cover of that, just defined as above, then there exists a diagram of object-wise and multiple equivalences in, that, in these directions. So in particular, the nerve is weakly equivalent to X. And the persistent nerve theorem is kind of folklore, I would say. Um, and the first version of that uh, that I've seen was by Chazal and co-authors um, quite a few years ago, actually. But um, Uli Bauer, Michael Kerber, Fabian Roll, and Alexander Wally, um, they, are, um, they are fixing some details and also um, having, a, having a more unified uh, view on that. And I think it will be published uh, this year, which, which I look forward to read. Okay, and, and, that, and that theorem is actually very useful and we will use it a lot of times. What we want to do is to construct a computationally efficient good cover up for the multi cover by filtration. So we don't want to get too many cover elements, or at least um, not too many intersections of these, so that the resulting simplicial complex, the nerve, will be relatively small. That's the whole goal, or at least the first goal. Um, that I will present in this talk. Okay, so what what can we do? Yeah, let me let me give you some preliminary words. So 
I believe that uh, the question that I just raised is open for, I don't know, 10 years or so, or maybe more, since the first publication that I found on this was is by Don Chi, it is nine years ago. And he observed that the multi-cover bifiltration has quite a nice intuition model. It's, it's, it's quite elegant mathematics. And it, it looks like this, yeah? I mean, I will not give a talk on this paper, but, um, but the idea is as follows. If you have the cover of your points, then you can look at the check complex, which is just the nerve um, of this cover. Then you can take the barocentric subdivision of this check complex. And then you can, um, then you can look at a filtering function on this barocentric subdivision. So formally, you, you can define um, the, the filtering function to be uh, the, 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 the flags of uh, some minimal uh, cardinality um, that depends on your k. And then in the end, um, you arrive at the top right picture. Alternatively, you can look at these k offsets. So these lenses here are exactly those lenses uh, of above. Um, and you can look at that nerve. And as you see here, the nerve looks differently than the check complex in it. And there is also no easy embedding. So that's, that's a first sign why it is not so easy to come up with a simplicial model for the multi-cover biofiltration. Yeah? It, it is just, there's just, just no simple relation between these two objects. What Don showed, however, is that you can also take the barocentric subdivision of this object here. And um, then you can also define um, this arrow to be um, the projection of of this uh, barycentric, barycentric subdivision to some sub-object. And when, after you have defined this thing, you can prove that it is actually the same as you have seen here at the top. So that's, that's a really nice model. And um, um, I, I can advertise that to read that paper because uh, I like it a lot. Um, now, so, so what we get is that the subdivision check by filtration um, is just the name for that procedure and is obtained by a filtration of the barocentric subdivision of, of the check complexes. Now, the problem is the number of vertices even is exponential in the input size. So it's even worse than looking at the check complexes in one parameter position analogy. So it's, in other words, it's completely unfeasible for any computational approach, I mean, at least um, unless you do something substantial, substantially new. Now, our first, our first thoughts were, were maybe we could work with that construction. But in the end, we, we uh, relatively quickly thought we should uh, take a view um, um, or we, we should take a look at alpha complexes and how to generalize that, which also leads uh, to Georg's work uh, that he presented last week. Or using the, the same word or the, the, the analogous word for the same thing, namely Delaunay complexes. So let me also quickly introduce that. So we, we, we first look at the von Neu regions of our point set which consists of those regions that are closest to exactly one point or to at least one point. So um, for this top point here, this region is the region um, that consists of all those, all those points that are closest to the top point. And you can play this game for all the other region, regions as well. And that's how you get these four null regions. What you can do now is to restrict the balls to those regions. And um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a very well-known construction and leads to the alpha complex in one parameter position homology. Now you can generalize that, however, also to higher dimensions or higher orders, which is the correct word if you look at the lit lit literature. Um, and the 
um, order two or briefly just two Voronoi diagram consists of those regions that are closest to two points. So if you look, look at the top right region, this region consists of all the po points that are closest to the top right, the two top right points. But as you can see, uh, the, reg the regions don't have to, uh, cons uh, um, the regions don't have to uh, have a point uh, in it, in the region itself. But what you can certainly do is play the same game as before and restrict the twofold covered regions, you know, these twofold offsets to this regions. Yeah, and for, of course, you can do that with focus three and so on. And what you should do then is take the nerve of these restricted covers. This is well known. Uh, you can do that for k equals one, and that's the Delaunay or alpha complex. And you can also do that for k equals two, three, and so on. The problem is that we do not get a filtration out of this process. Now let's look at this. Um, um, this nerve is in no simple relation with that one or with that one. So we have to do something there. And the first solution is we can take uh, the union of two consecutive covers. So um, if we take uh, both uh, the three and the two Voronoi intersected uh, three and two four covers, we can view that as a common cover of the twofold cover cover here. Um, because um, the left uh, yellow shape is included in the right yellow shape. And then we can take the nerve of both cover elements, uh, uh, of both covers, of all these cover elements. And that might look like this, yeah. I mean, okay, it, it, it does look like this, I computed it, but <laughs> what, what you get is, is quite uh, nice to see. Um, you get sort of a connection between these nerves that you desire to have. You don't get an inclusion, but you get this connection that you see on the right. And even more, you get that uh, the inclusion of this um, right nerve here into this big shape is actually a multiple equation. And the idea for how to prove that is, well, the first application of the persistent nerve theorem. And later on, we, we could also see that um, applying the homology functor, we also get a persistence module that indeed is even isomorphic to the one of the multi cover bifiltration, which is super cool. So let's look at, uh, at, at this in a little more detail. So how, how to prove that um, homotopy equivalence is, uh, that uh, uh, this map is a homotopy equivalent, equivalence. First of all, as I've mentioned before, um, these covers. So first of all, the, the, uh, the individual cover and also uh, taking that cover and the next cover, cover first of all the same space. And you can also check that both are good covers. So both are good covers of the same space and hence um, the persistent nerve theorem along this simple single inclusion yields the desired amount of equilibrium. And another thing is wh what I mentioned about isomorphic persistence modules. So just for, for this slide having a short notation, so otherwise the formulas uh, will not uh, fit on the slide. Um, by the lemma of above, we get that this zigzag here has a homotopy equivalence at the right. So this right arrow is a homotopy equivalence. Now, if we apply homology, then we get an isomorphism on homology. So we can also reverse that arrow. So we also get a map from the, um, yeah, from the left uh, vector space to the right vector space. And doing that everywhere for all these um, homotopy equivalences gives us a persistence module in the end. And if you take a little bit, um, if you go a little bit more into detail, observing that all these constructions are natural, we see that uh, this also yields a persistence module for, for the, the whole two-parameter setting. 
and that it's isomorphic to the one of the multi-cover bifurcation. There is, however, an algorithmic challenge inside. Transferring these bases consistently along this, uh, uh, along this left arrow and this reverse arrow is not so easy. Actually, we didn't, we didn't find a full solution to that. So in theory, this first construction is enough, but in practice, it isn't. So maybe we should think about this construction as a partial solution and think a little bit further. Namely, we can add all additional simplices of, of the above kind of higher case. This picture illustrates uh, quite nicely. So these two sheets were the ones that we have looked at before. But we can do the same construction, not only for these two sheets, but also for the next two sheets and so on. And at some point, the sheets will um, stop having simplices and you have just a finite um, collection of sheets. Uh, here it is, three. And taking the union of all of these uh, gives you a new simplicial complex. So formally, it is the union um, of all these nerves that we have uh, that we have constructed before. Yeah, the union for, for all higher case, so to say, or higher J's. And that is what we call Astel in the paper and also here. Now, this is what we call a theorem. Uh, and not only a lemma, because first of all, this S del, if you like look at all R's and all K's, um, is actually a bifiltration, first of all. So it's not just having a zigzag and in one direction is not too bad because it's no multiple equivalence, but is, it is actually a bifiltration. And it is weakly equivalent to the multi-cover bifiltration. So it is actually a simplicial model. And furthermore, it is much better than the one of Don uh, because um, its size is not exponential, but uh, just polynomial. Yeah, how, how to see that? Um, so the idea might be not so diff difficult to see on the picture. We have seen that um, we can, um, if, if we just had the first two sheets here on the right, we could just um, forget about the last sheet and also about these mixed simplices in between because there is a homotopy equivalence uh, from, the, from the first sheet to the mixed one. And doing that now um, um, inductively gives us that um, we also have um, a homotopy equivalence for all of these things. But let's uh, yeah, look at it a little bit more detailed. This is what I've um, I will do, I, I believe, yeah. So yeah, you, you can first observe uh, that these inclusions are homotopy equivalences. And what you do, uh, but, but you do need to do a little bit more. First of all, um, we can look at the so-called big cover. And that big cover consists of the, the wheel, the, 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 um, the wheel k-fold covers of um, level k, but also of level k plus one, k plus two, and so on. So these um, non-discrete covers. And this one is also a good cover of, um, it's also a good cover. Um, not, not of SDL, this is a mistake here, but it is a good cover of the covered space itself. But by the persistent nerve theorem, applied again to just a single inclusion, um, we get that um, the nerve of this big cover is weakly equivalent to the nerve of this um, smaller cover that we have seen before. Yeah, because again, just because both covers cover the same space um, and are good covers. So the persistent nerve theorem gives us also um, um, that, um, that uh, for, for, for these um, 
for these spaces that we have a, um, a, a homotopy equivalence, which is then also weak equivalence. Now, this inclusion, the full inclusion here, is a homotopy equivalence. And also, the first inclusion is a homotopy equivalence. And therefore, the second inclusion also has to be a homotopy equivalence. That's how you show it for, that's how you show that um, the, the last one is also a homotopy equivalence. But since all inclusions commute, we get that the actual bifiltrations, um, SL, yeah, the big one, the big simplicial one that we have constructed, um, yeah, that this inclusion from this bifiltration to this really big bifiltration um, is also uh, an object rise and multiple equivalence. And therefore, and therefore we, we get um, that, yeah, we have a weak equivalence. And in the paper, which is on the archive, you find a simpler argument, but this is, um, that was our first approach. So I, I thought it was worth, uh, it was worth to tell you about that as well. Okay, so yeah, this is, uh, let's, let's have a look at um, this picture again for a second. So uh, what I've just showed you is a simplicial model for the multi cover bifiltration that is relatively small. Um, and it, is, it consists of simplicial complexes, as I said. And it is a model in the sense that it's weakly equivalent to the multi cover bifiltration. So, in particular, it also has the same persistence modules. Now, yes, some of you um, have attended uh, uh, Georg's talk last week on the one bar tiling. And we have seen uh, the, the beautiful geometry of, of that construction, yet not so easy to digest, at least it was uh, like that for me. Um, but after a while, and after a while of digesting, and also after um, learning a lot uh, from, from Georg, we, we saw that this construction that I showed you actually has a connection to the one bar tile. And yeah, it is as follows. So first of all, let's recall some definitions. So if we start with a finite set of points that we may also call sites, and let's also assume general position to, to, make, it, uh, to make life a little bit simpler. Um, and if we take uh, an arbitrary sphere of co-dimension one, then this sphere yields a decomposition um, um, of your points into those points that are inside of the sphere, on the sphere, and outside. And that gives rise to define these rhomboids. Um, and these rhomboids of this sphere um, are the collection of these sets such that um, yeah, some points are um, um, yeah, such that um, um, those points that are inside um, the sphere um, and, and the union of, of, of these, uh, these points, um, such that um, uh, these points are also inside, um, uh, these are also on the sphere. And we call these elements, um, the, the elements of, of these one boards vertices, and then we call um, all these um, all these um, elements such, such uh, for, for, I mean for, for, I mean if we take all the the, the, the spheres and look at all these one boards, that's what we call the one board tiling of our original um, data set. Yeah, so let's look at the picture and you have seen that picture also last week, only in a different color, I guess. Um, so uh, <laughs> Um, so this this picture um, is the one bar tiling of five points on the real line. So just dimension one, A, B, C, D, and E. And the one bar tiling gives you all um, the Delaunay mosaics for all levels K, 
you just um, cut it there. But moreover, it the, the womboids um, um, also live on different levels at the same time. So you get uh, such an object. Now, what I've, what I've mentioned briefly is that we can slice the womboids along the hyperplanes, and then we get um, the, the Delaunay mosaics. And also, uh, we can look at the intermediate uh, parts, which we call slabs. So also, um, these womboids then decompose into intersections with such hyperplanes and slabs, so intermediate um, regions. And if we do that, we call the resulting polyhedral complex the sliced womboid tile. Okay, that's that's what we can do. And, may, and maybe you you get get what what I'm where I'm going to. Um, we we slice that thing in order to get something similar to what we've seen before. Do you remember we we had um, the simple simplicial complexes that connect these levels of K just with simplicial complexes. And now we want the one bytes to do the same job. So let's denote, um, yeah, let, let's, I mean, given this um, sliced one board tiling, um, we can look at uh, radii and, and individual Ks. Um, in order to, to get um, the, the, the spaces of our bifiltration. So first of all, this, this K row is the minimum depth among all the vertices of a one board. And by denoting the, by denoting row prime of the smallest dimension that such that it contains row, we define um, the radius to be um, R row um, such that it's exactly equal to that um, R row prime. And the key lemma is um, that the vertices of a sliced one board span a simplex in our SDL that we've seen before. And also conversely, the vertices of a simplex in our SDL are contained in a sliced one board of S. Uh, um, uh, are contained in a sliced one board at, at the same uh, position. Yeah? So for the same R and, and the same K. And it's not so easy to, to uh, get nice pictures for that because, and because it's also um, slightly confusing to me and I have to concentrate a lot to get all these things right. Um, but this is, this is a nice picture um, uh, which uh, has also been made by Georg. Um, and in this picture, you see the difference a little bit. So we have, um, I mean, the difference, yeah? We, ha we have three points, x, y, and z. And now the order one Voronoi region intersects in, the, these regions intersect in C here on the left. And the same holds true for the order two Voronoi regions of, of x, y. So let's see, yeah, it, it's that region here. And for the order two region of, of ZY and for the order two or no region of XZ. So they all meet in C. And S still contains a five simplex because if we let, uh, if we take the cover that is uh, given by all these cover elements, they all meet in C, and hence we get a um, five simplex. However, the corresponding cell in, in the one void um, just um, is a three dimensional triangular skew prism. However, you can jump um, between um, these constructions just using that key lemma that I showed you before. Now, using that key lemma, we, we arrive at a nice theorem, namely that the bifiltrations S1 and S are weakly equivalent. 
And in particular, that S1 is also weakly equivalent to the multicolor bulk equation. And here's the proof idea. So we use the key lemma. We know, so let's, let's have a look at the key lemma again for, for a short while. Um, so the vertices of a slice rhomboid at these uh, individual scales, they span a simplex in S del, and conversely, the vertices of a simplex in S del are also contained in a slice rhomboid uh, at the same level. So our idea is that we are allowed to form new covers of these simplicial complexes, um, just given by polyhedral cells sitting in S1. So, and, and this is what we did, yeah. Um, we construct a cover of S del such that for each individual scale, RK, um, that cover consists of simplices uh, spanned by vertices of the slice rhomboids. And this construction is actually isomorphic to a covering um, of S1 by all of its cells. And then the position nerve limma uh, just yields that we get again a weak, a weak equivalence. And I omit uh, quite a few details because uh, um, what we do here is not simple. Um, but um, yeah, by, by, by careful observation, we check that it uh, actually work, works out. So what I'm what I'm really um, what I'm really um, happy about, and what what I think is maybe even the strongest point um, um, of this whole project is that by this the theorem, we are free to use um, not only um, Georg's algorithms for the one board tiling, but also an efficient implementation by him. Because we can understand S del also by means of S1 and conversely. So if we so so we extended um, his implementations on rhomboids just a little bit, and then we were actually able to perform experiments with concrete output. That's uh, super cool in my opinion. Yeah, and I want to show you one. So this is an illustration of the Hilbert function of the persistence modules of the multi-cover bifiltration of some toy examples. Um, and you can see um, here at the, here we have um, circle, very clean, no noise. Here also just with a few more points. And we see the Hilbert functions that, yeah, that of course look uh, more or less the same, right? Um, and then we added a little bit of noise and we could also find that the Hilbert functions also look more or less the same. By the way, hey, do you this... want to remind people what the Hilbert function is? People might not know that language here. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure, sure. So um, if you have a um, um, if you have a persistence module, then the Hilbert function just gives you at each individual scale the dimension of the vector space there. So it captures, um, so to say, um, the um, at, at each scale um, the the number of holes, if you like. Okay, um, and this this grade scale shading. Um, corresponds to, I mean, the, the darker it is, the higher the dimension is at each individual scale. And this, the second, um, in particular, this, the second, um, the second computations have not been possible before. So we are the first ones to present such things. And we can also, um, yeah, and we can also um, compare the these circles uh, with noise with just noise yeah and only only some random points uh, in this in this plane uh, on the in the third row here and what you see actually is that uh, the Hilbert function looks completely different so it doesn't look like this nice flag anymore but it's just this this line and yeah we hope that um, in the future for, um, for more reasonable applications, because these are just, uh, just artificial toy examples, um, there might be um, some, 
some nice observations using that multi-couple bar filtration. Yeah, and in case you are interested in how, how long the uh, computations take us, um, yeah, th this is a table that you can also find in the appendix of our paper um, um, in dimension two and three, and with a couple of uh, points, we um, um, we tracked uh, the size of of, uh, of the, the, the bifiltration. And then the size um, of the free implicit uh, representation, and also the time that was necessary to compute it, and then also the time to compute minimal presentations because that's also something we've been done. And an additional table here because here, oh yeah, I, I should say <laughs> here we fix the maximal value. Um, and after this maximal value, we, we, we cut off. So we, we just assume for this example, it is enough to say, okay, we have the um, union of false filtration. And then we also look at scales K um, equals two and three and four, but we don't really care about everything that's happening before. As you've seen in this illustration before, okay, sometimes it might just be enough to look at the first K equals four or K equals 10 values. And um, yeah. For that, uh, for that uh, setting, um, you can see this table here. Now, what, what, we, what we also did is um, to let K grow a little bit more, um, but to fix the number of points. And again, um, yeah, we, we looked at um, sizes and times, and it doesn't take days, but uh, these times here are uh, in seconds, okay? Um, and yeah, it's, it's reasonable. So it's certainly uh, possible to perform some uh, experiments also for applications. That's at least what we hope, that what we hope to see in the future. Um, um, yeah, and, and that's possible just, just, um, just very recently because there is an efficient model. All right, so let me wrap up. Um, so there are two efficient discrete models. The one is simplicial. The other one is polyhedral. Yeah, the polyhedral one is the one-board one. And for the, uh, for the one-board tiling, there is an efficient implementation. So we can also perform these nice um, experiments. Yeah, because there is some efficient software given by Georg and uh, then extended. And we hope for new experiments that are also non-artificial, but really come from applications. Yeah, and that's uh, all I wanted to say for, for now, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Renee. Let's all give Renee a round of applause. Questions? Uh, I had a, a few details about, well, exactly that, uh, the figures you're showing there. Um, the x-axis, is that the radius or the cover, how many times it's covered? Uh, the x-axis is the radius and uh, the, the y-axis is uh, the, the depth, so the, the case. Okay, and you can compute it for all k's here up to the number of points? Um, yeah, so um well I, I don't remember exactly um but since the number of points here is not too big that's in principle possible i would say um in, in practice for applications where you have much more points however i, I would i would um yes you you should um, stop at some k um, yeah. to make it computationally more efficient i happen to remember this this actually was for 100 points that's the top yeah. And, and 200 points, sorry, that 100 points is on the left and 200 points is on the right. And, uh, and this did, these computations did use all K. I, I think we were able to, uh, to actually get up to 300. But th th this, uh, this, I think, uh, is suggestive of the limits that we were encountering. Yeah. 
for these kinds of things. Not that we tried that hard, but like I guess on a good desktop computer for us after like two or 300 points, things start to get a little harder. Other questions for Renee? Um, okay, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so uh, the complexity is is uh, like you are only like for these examples you you have dimension like two or three like uh, you looked at only like small dimensions, right? So the size of the rhomboid uh, tiling is also going to be not that big, right? Like it's something like the exponent is in, in, in the dimension d, right? D raised to d over two or something. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. So um, that means yeah. that uh, uh, the overall complexity like uh, should should be like polynomial, or uh, and actually a small polynomial like square or cube, something like that. So why is it that you have you don't you can't what what is stopping it from scaling to more points or oh, another from more k like higher k sorry that's what i meant like what, what's stopping it from scaling to higher k um so yeah we we, we can look at the we can look at the complexity bound again mm. Yeah, so so this is this this is uh, the overall um, complexity bound. Um, so so in, in in principle, you can of course um, con consider all Ks, um, and, and still the complexity bound holds. But um, um, if if you happen to have like a million of points, let's say, also in applications. Um, it might be that uh, this bound in practice just become becomes very high. I mean, it is polynomial, but maybe it becomes just in practice very high. And so, um, in case that uh, this is just in practice not compu computable anymore because the numbers are too high in general, then um, I, I would suggest to just cap the k at some point. But as you have seen in these um, um, in these experiments. Um, here it is possible to not cut k. Nice. I have sort of a related question. Um, sure. Uh, if you don't want all case, like if you if you want large case, but you don't want all case in the middle, can you get away with like computing four case, but the case are like one, two hundred? 400 and 800, or that's as difficult as computing all the case in between? That's a very good question. Um, we, we have considered that question uh, in between. Um, Mike, do you want to say anything about that? Um, I think uh, you, you have thought about this in more details. Yeah, so uh, I can say just a little bit. I think this is a really important question because uh, it, you um, just said maybe preface this by offering something in answer to the previous question. Uh, like one of the reasons that this uh, doesn't scale that well as K increases is because uh, you have to compute this, uh, just if you look at what's happening at an individual slice K, you have to compute this Kth order Delaunay object, this Delaunay mosaic for each K somehow you're remembering all of these, right? And these are not that small, right? Um, so, so that's a lot, so this is a big object in memory that you're building, right? So, so Lewis's question addresses exactly this. Uh, you know, maybe there's a way to, uh, to just look at a few values and, and you know, if you know something about interleavings that, uh, that if, you, if you do an approximation like that, it's not gonna, uh, affect the object too much as measured by the interleaving distance. Right, so, th so this is something that you want to do and, and uh, we don't know how to do it. We, I think we're optimistic that, uh, that something like this could be done, but it, it, it doesn't seem entirely trivial. I mean, Georg would probably be the best person to, uh, to address this because one would have to, oh, Georg is, is offering some 
some additional information. That was for the previous question, uh, like why you might, why the complexity is much better if you cut off at a small k. Uh, like, like the output complexity base is n to the d plus one if you go through all k, but there's this bound if you cut off at k, then it's roughly like n to the floor d plus one over two times k to the seal d plus one over two. So if you look at the two dimensional example and set, assume like, k to be a small constant, then your complexity goes down from cubic to linear. Like the linear with a factor which is, has a hidden k, k squared in there, like as an example. Let's see. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's helpful. So in any case, to return to the other question, uh, it, it, seems like, it seems like there's a good chance that it's possible, but we don't know how to do it. And uh, one would have to, uh, Modify George's algorithm. So, George, I don't know if you have anything to say about the prospect. Yeah. Of this. So, so my algorithm basically computes the, and, and most algorithms do this. It computes um, the the Delaunay mosaics iteratively. So it goes order one, order two, order three, and so on. So if you wanted to go to like order five hundred, you have to compute the previous ones, all of them. Um, you can save on memory by just throwing away the intermediate results, but not on computing costs. Um, however, there, I believe there are some algorithms out there which um, basically at the points one by one. There is something by uh, Ketan Mumuli um, from 91, an algorithm. And then there was a later one uh, by Yerji Matushek, uh, De Berg, and uh, one or two other authors, uh, which basically what they do is like if you want only one specific K, um, it also constructs basically um, the whole thing like intuitively, but it adds the points one by one. And each time you add a point, um, some of the stuff will definitely not be relevant anymore. It's like if you're in order 500, you already have a few points, then you know the, the very low and the very high orders, like on an intuitive level, they are not going to be influential anymore. So you throw them away early. And so that way, basically you can compute one um, one of these individually. I'm not sure if the complexity is actually much faster or faster at all, um, but it seems like in practice, it might be more efficient if there was an implementation, which I'm not aware of though. But these are like two references to look into for this uh, question, I think. I see, right. I mean. In my mind, it's plausible that even your iterative strategy could be appropriate here just because there would be such a memory savings. But the thing then is you need some approach that stitches together, say level 100 with level 200 directly. Yeah. Okay, so now I, I realize also that there's a, a message in the chat from Ana Laura. Or I don't know if it's Ana Laura or Ana Laura, but but they ask, do you also try for other shapes than a circle? You know. um, we, we have done something else in, uh, in addition. Um, so what, what we have also done is um, um, adding, adding a shape in between um, and, and um, adding some when, random, I mean, may, maybe I should annotate it here. It's, it's easier to draw. Um, so what I've also done, for instance, is to not just consider a circle, but to consider um, a neighborhood of a circle. So a geometric tubular neighborhood of some, with some distance in between and to uh, choose random points inside of there. And then to add additional uh, background noise. So that's, that's a, uh, yeah, so that's a little bit more far away from a circle because the radius is a little bit bigger than here. Um, but yeah, I have to frankly admit that more experiments are certainly desirable and um, it would be very interesting to see what, what comes out if, uh, if we look at more uh, complicated examples. Any other questions for Renee?
All right. Well, let's thank Renee once more. Thanks for the nice talk. <laughs>